out uh, among Indian universities. Uh, the the you know the culture of discussion, debate, argument, difference of opinion, uh, controversy. Uh, this is how we resolve our disputes. This is what we do when, when, whenever we are faced with a, a, a problem. And therefore, uh, it's wonderful that once again, it's not the first time, not the second time, probably not the third time, that you have again uh, uh, organized a debate on very, very important issue of what is a university? What does a university stand for? Not merely JNU, but what does a university stand for? <clears throat> I. Uh, uh, I think the most simple answer would be to for the creation of knowledge. Uh, universities stand for creation of knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> right? Do you agree with that? Universities stand for creation of knowledge? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah. I don't agree with that <laughs> entirely. Uh, because this argument uh, isolates the university from the society, you know, as if university is a, in one of an institution by itself, which is which has been uh, mandated to think, to generate knowledge, and the rest of the society doesn't do any of this kind. You know, I think this isolation of the university from the rest of the society is what is implicit in this statement that I gave you, with which I don't agree. Namely, that it generates no, it does generate knowledge, of course, yeah. But but uh, you know, there is a there is a there is a dichotomy in. Uh, in two words, uh, or four words, two words really, in Sanskrit words, they, 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 this dichotomy divides us into two groups, Shramjivi or Buddhijivi. We are the Buddhijivis, we, we live by our, the exercise of our mind. And there are Shramjivis who have constructed this pink palace and everything else. They, they, they don't live by the exercise of their mind, they live by the exercise of their body or their labor, you know. Shramjivi or Buddhijivi. So there is a very clear dichotomy between Shramjivi and Buddhijivi. This is in a way what is reflected also in, or at least implied in the statement that I made that university is where knowledge is produced and therefore the implication that others have nothing to do with the production of knowledge or creation of knowledge. Production is done in factories actually. So we should talk of creation of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, let us see that, you know, uh, in a way, all of us, whether we are uh, educated, uneducated, whether we are professors, whether we are laborers, whether we are farmers, whether we are whatever we are, men, women, children, all of us create knowledge in some way or the other, you know. All of us question something around us. All of us, in very small ways perhaps, we question something. When a child sort of questions why is the why are the leaves green and why is the sky blue? There is a question in his mind which perhaps might lead him later on to analyze the chemistry of colors, for example, you know, or to, to become an ast astro astrophysicist, for example, to understand the sky and so on and so forth, you know. So there is a question in his mind, in the child's mind, his or her mind, which, 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 is, which is important, which is creating a bit of knowledge for, for the child at that stage. You know. Or when a farmer asks, what kind of crop can I grow in this soil? Will it give me wheat or will it give me cotton? And then he experiments with the wheat or the cotton and finds out that the, that the, that it is a, it is the, the, the soil is more suited, suited for the production of cotton rather than of wheat. So he's asking a question, you know, and producing a, creating knowledge for himself. And all of us, therefore, create knowledge for ourselves, you know. In very little ways, very small ways, we can create knowledge. But these don't underestimate the smallness of this creation of knowledge because put together millions of these small creations of knowledge, billions really of small creations of knowledge, and it adds up to, adds up to enormous creation of knowledge. That's one part of it. The second part of it is that it's not merely small bits of knowledge that are being created every day, you know. Also big, big chunks of knowledge, new concepts evolve in the outside of the society, at the level of the Shramjivis, who are supposed to live by their labor and not by the exercise of their mind. Big, huge concepts are created by them. Let me give you one example which is very dear to me. Uh, as a 
medieval historian, I always go back to it. But that's not the only reason why I go back to it. You know, uh, in around, uh, let's say, 1000 AD, uh, although it's not an exact date, Islam comes to India. Islam had come to India much earlier in Kerala and, and Sindh, etc. But I'm taking 1000 AD, Mahmud of Ghazni and so on and so forth, and Moinuddin Chishti and so on. Islam comes to India. Islam brings a new concept of God which is unknown in India, to, to, to the Hindus in India, unknown. Islam has one la ilaha illallah, there is only one God, there are, no, there are no gods, there is only one God. Monotheism, as you put it in English. Uh, Hinduism has thousands of crores of gods. Islam brings a new form of worship of God, ibadat go namaz and so on. Hinduism has many, many forms of worship of God, worship of God or gods and goddesses and so on. So there are, there are two alternative uh, concepts of God, alternative concepts of uh, worship of God, etc., etc. They are, they are totally alternative to each other. You know? And therefore, there is tension, there is accommodation, there is confrontation, there is some bloodshed, there is all kinds of, as you would, have, as you would expect, for centuries, there would be all kinds of uh, relationships occurring between one religion and the other religion, or professors of one religion and another religion. What is the solution to this? It's not great intellectuals uh, in the, well, there were universities, uh, not, well, they were not called universities, but there were great intellectuals uh, around. They didn't find the solution. The solution to it was found by a evolving an absolutely new concept which is so unique to India. Concept which was evolved at the ground level by the Bhakti saints, medieval Bhakti saints, particularly Kabir, who, you know, the, the, there, is a, there is a confrontation or dichotomy or confrontation involved in the two religions that I, I described to you. One is of one kind, the other is of the other kind. There is complete dichotomy between them. There is nothing common between them, you know. And therefore, there is tension. Your Allah and my Ishwar, they are rivals to each other. They are competing with each other. And therefore, violence follows from that competition and so on and so forth, you know. Kabir said, forget about religion. Forget about... He, he, he evolved the concept of universal religiosity which concept he counterposed to denominational religions. When Kabir says, I'm not a Hindu, I'm not a Muslim, I don't go to the mosque, I don't go to the temple, he's really counterposing his religiosity, which is over and above, which overrides the denominational religion, which is counterposed to denominational religion. And therefore, he is finding a language which is not antithet antithetical to one another, but which is common to both, you know. And I think uh, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a huge concept. Try to understand the significance of it. The significance of it is that the so-called Muslim rule, we historians don't use these terms Muslim and rule and Hindu rule and so on and so forth. It, we were taught to use these terms by James Mill, the great colonial historian, the, the most outstanding colonialist historian, James Mill. He taught us to use Hindu period, Muslim period, we all know that. We have, since independence, we have forgotten all about it. We have we used different terms. But I'm using this term Muslim for, uh, for explaining my point. That for about 550 years of Muslim rule, so-called Muslim rule in India, highly centralized, very powerful, extending to almost the whole of the subcontinent, you know, barring the down south, barring Kerala, uh, the whole of the, and parts of Tamil Nadu, the whole of the subcontinent, you know, from Afghanistan right up to Bengal, and so on. A powerful, strong, centralized Mughal, uh, medieval state, you know, and Conflicts with the Mughal state, conflicts with the Sikhs, conflicts with the Jats, political conflicts, conflicts of power, conflicts of formation of states, lots of conflicts, bloodshed and arms, arms, use of arms and so on and so forth, you know. And yet, in the 550, 50 odd years, there was not a single communal riot in the whole of medieval India, not one. The first communal riot, the communal riots that occur under the ages of the secular state in the 20th, 21st century, about 500 of them every year, you know. Not one communal riot in the 
right up to the first communal riot that actually occurs. We go by record, so that's a record. In 1713-14, you know, uh, six, seven years after Aurangzeb death, even in the 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 demonic uh, image of Aurangzeb's rule, there was no communal riot. There were violence at the at the political level, at the level of. Uh, state formation and so on and so forth, but not at the social level. And my explanation for that is that the solution, the, 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 the social peace was preserved because of this resolution of the dichotomy between Islam and Hinduism at the social level by con evolving a concept of one universal God and one universal religiosity are counterposed to religion, Hinduism as well as Islam and so on. So, so Kabir's repeated emphasis, I am not a Hindu, I am not a Muslim, I don't go to mosque, I don't do, and he ridiculing uh, Mandira, Masjid and so on, we all, we all read that in our schools, you know. That is the, that is the grandeur of that concept which evolved, and he was not an intellectual, he was a weaver as we know, uh, Shramjeevi in the literal sense of the term, he, and all, most of them actually, but uh, I am talking particularly to picking up uh, uh, Kabir, because he's the most sort of vocal about it. So that concept, not merely daily kind of uh, inventions and uh, thinking and what do you do, what, how to do, how to grow a crop, etc. That is there, important. But more than that, even big concepts can evolve at the level. So that the basic point, the main point I'm making is that this dichotomy that we are, that is implied in my earlier statement, that university is where knowledge is produced. The dichotomy between the university, or at least difference between the university and the society, that does not exist. So, university exists in the context of a society. It operates in interaction with society, and all of these, all of these leads to, uh, leads to, uh, you know, the the uh, you you uh, uh, the uh, the tank of which our uh, honourable vice chancellor is very very fond, and which is going to be placed here somewhere. How, the, how did the tank evolve, you know, uh, uh, since tank is not mentioned in the Vedas, so I suppose India didn't uh, con con construct tanks in the Vedic period. Uh, I, I, uh, the, the story I read was that it was in Siberia actually that some, pa some villagers, they walked on the mud, very dense mud. Uh, Walking or uh, walking on this very comfortably on the surface, you know, not getting their feet stuck there because they were wearing a certain kinds of shoes which they had constructed with the local material, which is shaped like boats. You know, our shoes are flat, so when we put it on the mud, they are, our feet will sink, uh, will sink. But they had constructed boat like, you know, which doesn't, it's not flat. You know, it is from that way of shoes of villagers in Siberia that somebody who was a technician and scientist and so on so forth picked up the idea and constructed tanks, you know. So, you know, the great ideas, I mean, constructing tanks is not a great idea, but nonetheless, uh, uh, tank is a, is a big sort of, uh, big, big, uh, big thing to deal with. So, constructing big things, you know, comes from, from, many of this comes from, from social experience, experience, everyday experience, from the villager you know, from illiterate people. So, so, so let us first of all establish that, let's first of all accept that so, uh, university is part of the social framework. University is not outside of the social, work, social framework, doesn't operate outside of it. And therefore there is a complete link between so, uh, university and, 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 and society. And therefore when, when we are told, when you young people are told uh, by your parents or neighbors or elders and so on. You students, why do you agitate? Go and agitate in university. Go and read there. That's that's what you are, do study there. That's what you are there for, you know. Uh, therefore, they are again isolating. Study there, uh, but don't interact with, uh, don't, concern, don't concern yourself with what's happening in society. You have got to concern yourself with, with because study precisely means interaction with society, you know. Uh, you can't study uh, in, a, so in, a, in a university without, you are, because you are studying interaction with society. In your study, there is interaction with society, you know, whether you, you like it or not, whether you are aware of it or not, but it's there. So, there is a deep interlink between the university and the society, which we have to be, be aware of. 
and the be it's better the more we are aware of it the better it is for all of us you know that's one but you know having said that uh, let me now come to the university uh, you know see special you know a farmer has thinks about lots of things but he also mainly thinks about farming you know a tailor thinks about lots of things but he also he thinks mainly about uh, so there is a kind of specialization as well there is a general kind of thinking there is also specialized kind of thinking you know a university is has been assigned the role by society and university hasn't come uh, in the last 20 years or 50 years or 500 years the first university which was not called university obviously not vishwavidyalaya but it it had all the attributes of you know she was in takshila uh, 6 7th or 6th century bc it was a it was a virtually a fully fledged university our honorable prime minister thought that takshila was in bihar actually when he was before he became prime minister of course after becoming prime minister he probably came to know you remember he said in in, in an election rally in bihar uh, first he said uh, alexander had been defeated by biharis in bihar you know <laughs> and then he said takshila was a great university in bihar uh, he, uh, he he didn't uh, he didn't remember that we had left it behind in pakistan but anyway that just by the way so universities have been around from as far back as you can go you know uh, takshila nalanda sorbonne cambridge oxford etc they have been around for hundreds and thousands of years you know uh, so why were why have they been around because the society assigns them the role of specific role apart from general role that i talked about specific role of of uh, of uh, what shall i say critiquing society critiquing not only society critiquing everything critiquing doesn't mean criticizing Critici critiquing doesn't mean de demolition Critici critiquing is not a negative uh, uh, term critiquing is trying to understand whatever the phenomenon is whether it is science or it is astronomy or it is uh, history or it is economics or whatever whatever you know critique you critiquing means you understand the nature of that discipline you know where has it come from how has it evolved what are its weaknesses where has it where is it going etc that's what critiquing is and therefore this is a job uh, and including society economy politics uh, science everything you know this is the job assigned by society to the universities to do specialized work specialized thinking on critiquing discipline critiquing everything that every every kind of discipline that we study you know so that it is through self questioning that knowledge advances knowledge always always advances through self questioning you know you question and question again doesn't mean disrespect you know question is again trying to understand question the received knowledge and then go forward after all we all remember uh, Galileo was a professor of astronomy in Italy, 16th, 17th century. Uh, just think of what had happened if he had not, if he had not questioned, received knowledge that the Earth is flat and the Earth and the and the Sun goes around the Earth, you know. And when he critiqued it and he found that it's the other way around, it's the it's the uh, it's the Earth which moves on its axis and moves around the sun and then you, you we all know what happened when he said that he had to he had heard the religious sentiments of the pope and millions of catholics then you know uh, millions all the catholics then who were millions he heard their sentiment and they excommunicated him from christianity he had to apologize he had to recant he said no i was wrong it is a sun which goes around the uh, around the earth but when he was dying, he said, last few were beautiful words, he said, it still moves, you know, uh, earth still moves, you know. So that, that deep honesty in him, you know, it's all right, he was, by the way, uh, the religious sentiments which are heard in, the, heard in the 17th century, they were remedied only in 1992. In 1992, the, then, then Pope this, this declared, that actually Galileo was right and our Pope was wrong, you know. So it took about 400, 300 years 
for the religious, religious sentiment to be uh, redeemed. So that, you know, imagine if you don't ask questions, what happens to knowledge? You must, questioning is so central to the advancement, advancement of knowledge. Not only questioning other knowledge, questioning your own knowledge, you know. That is central to the advancement of, and that's what the university has, university, a university, the university, universities have been uh, assigned the role by that, by society, you know, to, to, to critique received knowledge and go beyond that knowledge, you know. And when we are living in an, an, an atmosphere when we are told questioning is unpatriotic, questioning is, goes against the Indian spirit, Indian spirit is actually so full of questioning. There is, in fact, there are very few uh, philosophical systems where it's, there is so much of questioning, you know. Uh, in India, so that when we are told, uh, don't question, just accept what we are saying, you know. Uh, there is also a question of power. Uh, implicit in this, question, in this questioning and the denial of questioning, you know. When you question, when uh, Galileo questioned uh, the received knowledge, uh, he was also questioning the power of the Pope and the, and, and the uh, clergy. He was questioning that power. Not directly, he was not interested in questioning the power. He was interested only in acquiring knowledge. But that knowledge questioned the power, and therefore he was punished so, so severely that. Uh, any questioning is also questioning the power of some or the other. You know, uh, when Mansur al Hallaj said three words in Arabic, an al haq I am the truth, which also means I am God. Uh, the truth, haq in Arabic and Persian and Urdu means many things. It means your right, it means uh, uh, correct, it means truth, it means the truth. So haq, an al haq I am the truth. The truth is God. God is the truth. And therefore, it also means I am the truth. I am the I am God. I am God is not that He is God. He was not claiming to be God. He was He was really saying, God is there in every one of us. Each one of us God inside us. So why do I have to go to the mosque to say my prayers? I'll say it in my heart. You know. He was just saying I, all that he said was Anal has. God, I am the God. God is inside me, and therefore inside everyone. And you know, he was he was killed for saying that. So because he had questioned power, power of the of the uh, Muslim clergy, you know. And therefore, questioning also involves whether you want it or not. You don't set out to uh, when Professor Prabhat Patnaik, uh, you know, gives you a lecture on econ economics of imperialism. He's not out to question the power of. Uh, that's not his intention. Uh, or any, uh, Professor Chaman Lai gives you a theory, Chaman Lai gives you a theory of literature, uh, which is different from the theory of literature that you are familiar with. He's not question, he, he's not out to question, he's not, he's not out to contest the power, you know. But that contest of power is implicit in any questioning, you know. And therefore, also the suppression of the questioning is also expected in that. And therefore, when you are, when you are being denied the right to question, you are, you are, uh, you are, you are, you are being, you are being, uh, you are being treated as the, as the enemy, as the other of those who hold power, and therefore challenge to that power, you know, whether you want it or not. Again and again, again, I'm saying whether you, what power do we teachers have anyway, except, except for writing some books and so on and so forth. What, what is the power? But there is power, you know, there is power in an al -Haq. There is power in the fact that the earth goes around the sun and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. One can go on with that. You know. So that, friends, uh, JNU, uh, I've been associated with JNU from right from the beginning, almost 71 on, onwards to 2004. So these were great years here, formative years here. One, one thing that we all loved, and you, I'm sure, uh, love it still, is that Freedom to ask questions, freedom to frame our own courses, freedom to teach the way they wanted, we wanted to teach, and the students, the freedom that students got to frame their own argument, to contest the arguments of the challenge, the argument of the teachers, etc., uh, etc. Et that freedom, 
to challenge the freedom to question. The freedom to question is what put JNU on on top of the list of universities. That's what is so so prized, so wonderful, so precious in JNU, and that is what is under attack. I was also asked to very briefly. I I don't want to go into my my tenure as a as a rector and so on. I was there only for two years or so, very briefly. But you know, uh, we were also gerawed uh, here. Uh, surely, in fact, my <laughs> since, since it has come to that, I have the badge of I wear the badge of honor belonging to the Center for Historical Studies. Uh, the Center for Historical Studies was the first faculty to have been gerawed by students <laughs> in 1972, I think, if I'm not wrong, or 73, beginning. Uh, no, 73 beginning of 73 or something around that, you know. Uh, we were get out uh, for some reason. Uh, and what a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere it was, you know. At, at one time, uh, there were there were more of us inside the room, Professor Pippin Chandra's room, we were sitting in that town campus. Uh, there were four or five of us inside the room and two or three of the students who were gharayunga. So we could have easily walked out, you know. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, uh, a norm is a norm, you know, if you are under gherao, you don't walk out, you see, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we sat there, you know, uh, we just sat there, until the vice chancellor, the great G. Parthasarthi called us uh, to his office sometime at about 9 o'clock in the evening, and uh, called us all and sorted it out, and he sent out uh, the university bus to, there was no hostels then, he sent out the, sent the students, to their homes as university bus and asked us to take taxi and so on so forth, you know. So, but that was the atmosphere, you know, that, and we loved that atmosphere. So, uh, we were, I was get out, we were get out as teachers, uh, not once, but more than once. I was also get out as rector and so on and so forth. Okay, we took that as a, as in our style, that, that, that part of our, uh, that part of, the part of JNU, you know. Uh, uh, and those, uh, I must say, those, those the students who were gharayung, gharayung, they were also very considerate to those, you know. They they didn't deny food to us. Uh, we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to steal food from here and there. And they let food come into, from our homes to our uh, rooms. They, we had our, med we had to take our medicines. They let our medicines come to us, etc. That was the atmosphere, you know. And that was the atmosphere. There was no sort of, even under Gerao, there was not that hostility towards, you know, uh, towards the students, you see. That is what is so disheartening, so distressing, so, so, so painful. That is what is changing in JNU. And that is what is, uh, that's what brings us old timers again and again to whenever you call us, to remind you that, uh, that the past was, is the past was great, the present is uh, somewhat under the cloud. But I think future always is bright. Thank you very much.